Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the August 2022 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of The National Question and Leninism, a reply to comrades Meshkov, Kabalchuk, and others, March 18, 1929, by Stalin. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So the source of this piece is Works, Volume 11, January 1928 to March 1929. The publisher, Foreign Languages Publishing House, Moscow, 1954. HTML transcription and markup by Salil Sen for Marxist's Internet Archive. Thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Marxists.org is the web address. So this piece is part of a series that we're doing of writings on war and nationalism here at Socialism for All. This is, I think, an important topic for more aspiring Marxists to grasp, so we are doing quite a few texts on this subject. And you can find this text on a number of playlists, the All Authors, All Audiobooks playlist, the All Works by Joseph Stalin playlist, the Russia and USSR playlist, and the Marxism and the National Question playlist. I'll link those in a pinned comment on the YouTube channel. So, let's get into the audiobook. I have received your letters. They are similar to a number of letters on the same subject I have received from other comrades during the past few months. I have decided, however, to answer you particularly, because you put things more bluntly and thereby help the achievement of clarity. True, the answers you give in your letters to the questions raised are wrong, but that's another matter of that we shall speak below. Let us get down to business. 1. The Concept of Nation The Russian Marxists have long had their theory of the nation. According to this theory, a nation is a historically constituted, stable community of people formed on the basis of the common possession of four principal characteristics, namely, a common language, a common territory, a common economic life, and a common psychological makeup, manifested in common, specific features of national culture. This theory, as we know, has received general recognition in our party. Comment, if you're not already familiar with it, please see Stalin's Marxism and the National Question from 1913, which expands on this definition and contrasts it to other competing definitions from the time. It is evident from your letters that you consider this theory inadequate, you therefore propose that the four characteristics of a nation be supplemented by a fifth, namely, that a nation possesses its own separate national state. You consider that there is not and cannot be a nation unless this fifth characteristic is present. I think that the scheme you propose, with its new fifth characteristic of the concept, nation, is profoundly mistaken and cannot be justified either theoretically or in practice politically. According to your scheme, only such nations are to be recognized as nations as have their own state, separate from others, whereas all oppressed nations, which have no independent statehood, would have to be deleted from the category of nations. Moreover, the struggle of oppressed nations against national oppression and the struggle of colonial peoples against imperialism would have to be excluded from the concept national movement and national liberation movement. More than that, according to your scheme, we would have to assert a that the Irish became a nation only after the formation of the Irish Free State, and that before that they did not constitute a nation. b. That the Norwegians were not a nation before Norway's secession from Sweden, and became a nation only after that secession. c. That the Ukrainians were not a nation when the Ukraine formed part of Tsarist Russia, that they became a nation only after they seceded from Soviet Russia under the Central Rada and Hetman Skoropadsky, but again ceased to be a nation after they united their Ukrainian Soviet Republic with the other Soviet republics to form the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. A great many such examples could be cited. Obviously, a scheme which leads to such absurd conclusions cannot be regarded as a scientific scheme. In practice, politically, your scheme inevitably leads to the justification of national imperialist oppression, whose exponents emphatically refuse to recognize as real nations, oppressed and unequal nations, which have no separate national state of their own, and consider that this circumstance gives them the right to oppress these nations. That's apart from the fact that your scheme provides a justification for the bourgeois nationalists in our Soviet republics who argue that the Soviet nations ceased to be nations when they agreed to unite 
their national Soviet republics into a union of Soviet socialist republics. That is how matters stand with regard to, quote, supplementing and, quote, amending the Russian Marxist theory of the nation. Only one thing remains, and that is to admit that the Russian Marxist theory of the nation is the only correct theory. So that's the end of section one. I just want to comment here a lot of the discussion in Europe and in the Russian party about nationhood and just the question of nations in general revolved around the right of nations to self-determination, which was to be understood as the right to political secession, i.e. the right of the nation to form a state. If going by this sort of absurd thing, I kind of can't believe that that was even proposed, we were to say that nations are ones which already have a state definitionally. I mean, it just, it hugely contradicts the entire earlier discussion. And it raises the question, for example, in the case of Norway's secession from Sweden, well, on what basis were the people of Norway who were proposing the secession organizing to begin with? If they were not already a nation, what were they? What would be the term for a people who are so organized yet do not have that fifth criterion of the state? So what would that pre-state community be called? You know, proto-nation? It just really flies in the face of all the historical discussion that was taking place on this topic. Anyway, section two, the rise and development of nations. One of the grave mistakes you make is that you lump together all existing nations and fail to see any fundamental difference between them. There are different kinds of nations. There are nations which developed in the epoch of rising capitalism, when the bourgeoisie, destroying feudalism and feudal disunity, gathered the parts of nations together and cemented them. These are the so-called modern nations. You assert that nations arose and existed before capitalism, but how could nations have arisen and existed before capitalism, in the period of feudalism, when countries were split up into separate, independent principalities, which, far from being bound together by national ties, emphatically denied the necessity for such ties? Your erroneous assertions notwithstanding, there were no nations in the pre-capitalist period, nor could there be, because there were as yet no national markets and no economic or cultural national centers, and consequently there were none of the factors which put an end to the economic disunity of a given people and drew its hitherto disunited parts together into one national whole. Of course, the elements of nationhood, language, territory, common culture, etc., did not fall from the skies, but were being formed gradually, even in the pre-capitalist period. But these elements were in a rudimentary state, and at best were only a potentiality, that is, they constituted the possibility of the formation of a nation in the future, given certain favorable conditions. The potentiality became a reality only in the period of rising capitalism, with its national market and its economic and cultural centers. In this connection, it would be well to recall the remarkable words of Lenin on the subject of the rise of nations, contained in his pamphlet, What the Friends of the People Are and How They Fight the Social Democrats. Controverting the Narodnik Mikhailovsky, who derived the rise of nationalities and national unity from the development of gentle ties, Lenin says, quote, And so, national ties are a continuation and generalization of gentle ties. Mr. Mikhailovsky evidently borrows his ideas of the history of society from the fairy tale that is taught to schoolboys. The history of society this copybook doctrine runs, is that first there was the family, that nucleus of all society, then the family grew into the tribe, and the tribe grew into the state. If Mr. Mikhailovsky solemnly repeats this childish nonsense, it only goes to show, apart from everything else, that he has not the slightest notion of the course even of Russian history. While one might speak of gentle life in ancient Rus, there can be no doubt that by the Middle Ages, the era of the Muscovite Tsars, these gentle ties no longer existed. That is to say, the state was based not at all on gentle unions, but on territorial unions. The landlords and the monasteries took their peasants from various localities, and the village communities thus formed were purely territorial unions. But one could hardly speak of national ties in the true sense of the word at that time. The state was divided into separate lands, sometimes even principalities, which preserved strong traces of former autonomy peculiarities of administration, at times their own troops. The local boyars went to war at the head of their own companies, their own customs borders, and so forth. Only the modern period of Russian history, 
beginning approximately with the 17th century, is characterized by an actual merging of all such regions, lands, and principalities into a single whole. This merging, most esteemed Mr. Mikolovsky, was not brought about by gentle ties, nor even by their continuation and generalization. It was brought about by the growth of exchange between regions, gradual growth of commodity circulation, and the concentration of the small local markets into a single all-Russian market. Since the leaders and masters of this process were the merchant capitalists, the creation of these national ties was nothing but the creation of bourgeois ties." Unquote. That is how matters stand with regard to the rise of the so-called modern nations. The bourgeoisie and its nationalist parties were throughout this period the chief leading force of such nations. Class peace within the nation for the sake of national unity, expansion of the territory of one's own nation by seizure of the national territories of others, distrust and hatred of other nations, suppression of national minorities, a united front with imperialism, such as the ideological, social, and political stock and trade of these nations. Such nations must be qualified as bourgeois nations. Examples are the French, British, Italian, North American, and other similar nations. The Russian, Ukrainian, Tatar, Armenian, Georgian, and other nations in Russia were likewise bourgeois nations before the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the Soviet system in our country. Naturally, the fate of such nations is linked with the fate of capitalism. With the fall of capitalism, such nations must depart from the scene. It is precisely such bourgeois nations that Stalin's pamphlet, Marxism and the National Question, has in mind when it says that, quote, a nation is not merely a historical category, but a historical category belonging to a definite epoch, the epoch of rising capitalism, that the fate of a national movement, which is essentially a bourgeois movement, is naturally bound up with the fate of the bourgeoisie, that the final disappearance of a national movement is possible only with the downfall of the bourgeoisie, and that only under the reign of socialism can peace be fully established. That is how matters stand with regard to the bourgeois nations. But there are other nations. These are the new Soviet nations, which developed and took shape on the basis of the old bourgeois nations after the overthrow of capitalism in Russia, after the elimination of the bourgeoisie and its nationalist parties, after the establishment of the Soviet system. The working class and its internationalist party are the force that cements these new nations and leads them. An alliance between the working class and the working peasantry within the nation for the elimination of the survivals of capitalism in order that socialism may be built triumphantly, abolition of the survivals of national oppression, in order that the nations and national minorities may be equal and may develop freely, elimination of the survivals of nationalism in order that friendship may be knit between the peoples and internationalism firmly established, a united front with all oppressed and unequal nations in the struggle against the policy of annexation and wars of annexation, in the struggle against imperialism, such as the spiritual, and social and political complexion of these nations. Such nations must be qualified as socialist nations. These new nations arose and developed on the basis of old bourgeois nations as a result of the elimination of capitalism by their radical transformation on socialist lines. Nobody can deny that the present socialist nations of the Soviet Union, the Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, Tatar, Bashkir, Uzbek, Kazakh, Azerbaijanian, Georgian, Armenian, and other nations differ radically from the corresponding old bourgeois nations of the old Russia, both in class composition and spiritual complexion, and in social and political interests and aspirations. Such are the two types of nations known to history. You do not agree with linking the fate of nations, in this case the old bourgeois nations, with the fate of capitalism. You do not agree with the thesis that, with the elimination of capitalism, the old bourgeois nations will be eliminated. But with what, indeed, could the fate of these nations be linked, if not with the fate of capitalism? Is it so difficult to understand that when capitalism disappears, the bourgeois nations it gave rise to must also disappear? Surely, you do not think that the old bourgeois nations can exist and develop under the Soviet system, under the dictatorship of the proletariat? That would be the last straw. You are afraid that the elimination of the nations existing under capitalism is tantamount to the elimination of nations in general. To the elimination of all nations. Why? On what grounds? Are you really unaware of the fact that besides bourgeois nations there are other nations, socialist nations, which are much more solidly united and capable of surviving than any bourgeois nation, 
Your mistake lies precisely in the fact that you see no other nations except bourgeois nations, and consequently you have overlooked the whole epoch of formation of socialist nations in the Soviet Union, nations which arose on the ruins of the old bourgeois nations. The fact of the matter is that the elimination of the bourgeois nations signifies the elimination not of nations in general, but only of the bourgeois nations. On the ruins of the old bourgeois nations, new socialist nations are arising and developing, and they are far more solidly united than any bourgeois nation, because they are exempt from the irreconcilable class contradictions that corrode the bourgeois nations, and are far more representative of the whole people than any bourgeois nation. 3. The Future of Nations and of National Languages You commit a grave error in putting a sign of equality between the period of the victory of socialism in one country and the period of the victory of socialism on a world scale in asserting that the disappearance of national differences and national languages, the merging of nations, and the formation of one common language are possible and necessary not only with the victory of socialism on a world scale, but also with the victory of socialism in one country. Moreover, you confuse entirely different things, the abolition of national oppression with the elimination of national differences, the abolition of national state barriers with the dying away of nations, with the merging of nations. It must be pointed out that for Marxists to confuse these diverse concepts is absolutely impermissible. National oppression in our country was abolished long ago, but it by no means follows from this that national differences have disappeared, and that nations in our country have been eliminated. National state barriers, together with frontier guards and customs, were abolished in our country long ago, but it by no means follows from this that the nations have already become merged, and that the national languages have disappeared, that these languages have been supplanted by some one language common to all our nations. You are displeased with the speech I delivered at the Communist University of the Peoples of the East in 1925, in which I repudiated the thesis that with the victory of socialism in one country, in our country, for example, national languages will die away, that the nations will be merged, and in place of the national languages, one common language will appear. You consider that this statement of mine contradicts Lenin's well-known thesis that it is the aim of socialism not only to abolish the division of mankind into small states and every form of isolation of nations, not only to bring the nations closer together, but also to merge them. You consider further that it also contradicts another of Lenin's theses, namely that with the victory of socialism on a world scale, national differences and national languages will begin to die away that after this victory national languages will begin to be supplanted by one common language. That is quite wrong, comrades. It is a profound illusion. I've already said that it is impermissible for Marxists to confuse and lump together such diverse phenomena as the victory of socialism in one country and the victory of socialism on a world scale. It should not be forgotten that these diverse phenomena reflect two entirely different epochs, distinct from one another, not only in time, which is very important, but in their very nature. National distrust, national isolation, national enmity, and national conflicts are, of course, stimulated and fostered not by some innate sentiment of national animosity, but by the striving of imperialism to subjugate other nations, and by the fear inspired in these nations by the menace of national enslavement. Undoubtedly, so long as world imperialism exists, this thriving and this fear will exist, and consequently, national distrust national isolation, national enmity, and national conflicts will exist in the vast majority of countries. Can it be asserted that the victory of socialism and the abolition of imperialism in one country signify the abolition of imperialism and national oppression in the majority of countries? Obviously not. But it follows from this that the victory of socialism in one country, notwithstanding the fact that it also seriously weakens world imperialism, does not and cannot create the conditions necessary for the merging of the nations and the national languages of the world into one integral whole. The period of the victory of socialism on a world scale differs from the period of the victory of socialism in one country primarily in the fact that it will abolish imperialism in all countries, will abolish both the striving to subjugate other nations and the fear inspired by the menace of national enslavement, will radically undermine national distrust and national enmity, will unite the nations into one world socialist economic system, and will thus create the real conditions necessary for the gradual merging of all nations into one. Such is the fundamental difference between these two periods. But it follows from this that to confuse these two different periods and to lump them together is to commit an unpardonable mistake. 
Take the speech I delivered at the Communist University of the Toilers of the East. There I said, quote, Some people, Kautsky for instance, talk of the creation of a single universal language and the dying away of all other languages in the period of socialism. I have little faith in this theory of a single, all-embracing language. Experience, at any rate, speaks against rather than for such a theory. Until now, what has happened has been that the socialist revolution has not diminished, but rather increased the number of languages, for, stirring up the lowest sections of humanity and pushing them on to the political arena, it awakens to new life a number of hitherto unknown or little-known nationalities. Who could have imagined that the old Tsarist Russia consisted of not less than 50 nations and national groups? The October Revolution, however, by breaking the old chains and bringing together a number of forgotten peoples and nationalities onto the scene, gave them new life and a new development." Unquote. From this passage it is evident that I was opposing people of the type of Kautsky, who always was and has remained a dilettante on the national question, who does not understand the mechanics of the development of nations and has no inkling of the colossal power of stability possessed by nations, who believes that the merging of nations is possible long before the victory of socialism, already under the bourgeois democratic order, and who, servilely praising the assimilating work of the Germans in Bohemia, light-mindedly asserts that the Czechs are almost Germanized, that, as a nation, the Czechs have no future. From this passage it is evident further that what I had in mind in my speech was not the period of the victory of socialism on a world scale, but exclusively the period of the victory of socialism in one country. And I affirmed, and continue to affirm, that the period of the victory of socialism in one country does not create the necessary conditions for the merging of nations and national languages. That on the contrary, this period creates favorable conditions for the renaissance and flourishing of the nations that were formerly oppressed by Tsarist imperialism and have now been liberated from national oppression, by the Soviet Revolution. From this passage, it is apparent, lastly, that you have overlooked the colossal difference between the two different historical periods, that because of this, you have failed to understand the meaning of Stalin's speech, and as a result, have gotten lost in the wilderness of your own errors. Let us pass to Lenin's theses on the dying away and merging of nations after the victory of socialism on a world scale. Here is one of Lenin's theses taken from his article, The Socialist Revolution and the Right of Nations to Self-Determination, published in 1916, which for some reason is not quoted in full in your letters. Quote, the aim of socialism is not only to abolish the division of mankind into small states and all isolation of nations, not only to draw the nations together, but to merge them, just as mankind can arrive at the abolition of classes only by passing through a transition period of the dictatorship of the oppressed class, so mankind can arrive at the inevitable merging of nations only by passing through a transition period of complete liberation of all the oppressed nations, i.e. of their freedom of secession." Unquote. And here is another thesis of Lenin's which you likewise do not quote in full. Quote, as long as national and state differences exist among peoples and countries, and these differences will continue to exist for a very, very long time, even after the dictatorship of the proletariat has been established on a world scale, the unity of international tactics of the communist working class movement of all countries demands not the elimination of variety, not the abolition of national differences, that is a foolish dream at the present moment, but such an application of the fundamental principles of communism, Soviet power and the dictatorship of the proletariat, as would correctly modify these principles in certain particulars, correctly adapt and apply them to national and national state differences." Unquote. It should be noted that this passage is from Lenin's pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism, an Infantile Disorder, published in 1920, that is, after the victory of the Socialist Revolution in one country, after the victory of socialism in our country. From these passages, it is evident that Lenin does not assign the process of the dying away of national differences and the merging of nations to the period of the victory of socialism in one country, but exclusively to the period after the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat on a world scale, that is, to the period of the victory of socialism in all countries, when the foundations of a world socialist economy have already been laid. From these passages it is evident further that the attempt to assign the process of the dying away of national differences to the period of the victory of socialism in one country, in our country, is qualified by Lenin as a, quote, foolish dream. From these passages, it is evident, moreover, 
that Stalin was absolutely right when, in the speech he delivered at the Communist University of the Toilers of the East, he denied that it was possible for national differences and national languages to die away in the period of the victory of socialism in one country, in our country, and that you are absolutely wrong in upholding something that is the direct opposite of Stalin's thesis. From these passages, it is evident, lastly, that in confusing the two different periods of the victory of socialism, you failed to understand Lenin, distorted Lenin's line on the national question, and as a consequence, involuntarily headed for a rupture with Leninism. It would be incorrect to think that after the defeat of world imperialism, national differences will be abolished and national languages will die away immediately, at one stroke, by decree from above, so to speak. Nothing is more erroneous than this view. To attempt to bring about the merging of nations by decree from above, by compulsion, would be playing into the hands of the imperialists. It would spell disaster to the cause of the liberation of nations, and be fatal to the cause of organizing cooperation and fraternity among nations. Such a policy would be tantamount to a policy of assimilation. You know, of course, that the policy of assimilation is absolutely excluded from the arsenal of Marxism-Leninism, as being an anti-popular and counter-revolutionary policy, a fatal policy. Furthermore, we know that nations and national languages possess an extraordinary stability and tremendous power of resistance to the policy of assimilation. The Turkish assimilators, the most brutal of all assimilators, mangled and mutilated the Balkan nations for hundreds of years, yet not only did they fail to destroy them, but in the end were forced to capitulate. The Tsarist Russian Russifiers and the German Prussian Germanizers, who yielded little in brutality to the Turkish assimilators, rent and mangled the Polish nation for over a hundred years, just as the Persian and Turkish assimilators, for hundreds of years, rent and mangled and massacred the Armenian and Georgian nations. Yet, far from destroying these nations, in the end, they were also forced to capitulate. All these circumstances must be taken into account in order to correctly forecast the probable course of events as regards the development of nations directly after the defeat of world imperialism. It would be a mistake to think that the first stage of the period of the world dictatorship of the proletariat will mark the beginning of the dying way of nations and national languages, the beginning of the formation of one common language. On the contrary, the first stage, during which national oppression will be completely abolished, will be a stage marked by the growth and flourishing of the formerly oppressed nations and national languages, the consolidation of equality among nations, the elimination of mutual national distrust, and the establishment and strengthening of international ties among nations. Only in the second stage of the period of the world dictatorship of the proletariat, to the extent that a single world socialist economy is built up in place of the world capitalist economy, only in that stage will something in the nature of a common language begin to take shape. For only in that stage will the nations feel the need to have, in addition to their own national languages, a common international language for convenience of intercourse and of economic, cultural, and political cooperation. Consequently, in this stage, national languages and a common international language will exist side by side. It is possible that at first, not one world economic center will be formed, common to all nations and with one common language, but several zonal economic centers for separate groups of nations, with a separate common language for each group of nations, and that only later will these centers combine into one common world socialist economic center with one language common to all the nations. In the next stage of the period of world dictatorship of the proletariat, when the world socialist system of economy becomes sufficiently consolidated and socialism becomes part and parcel of the life of the peoples, and when practice convinces the nations of the advantages of a common language over national languages, national differences in languages will begin to die away and make room for a world language common to all nations. Such, in my opinion, is the approximate picture of the future of nations, a picture of the development of the nations along the path to their merging in the future. That's the end of section three. I just want to comment here. That is, as Stalin says, his opinion of the approximate picture of the future of nations. Note, though, that he's putting no special stress on this happening. He believes that the economic activity is going to lead the national and you know, language and other cultural activity connected with nations. That first, there will be a period of the flourishing of suppressed nations, including nations almost forgotten completely to exist, as they come up on the same level of importance and rights as all other nations, including former oppressor nations, which are going to be brought down a few pegs. 
Then, from that position of all the different nations being on basically equal footing with regard to rights and privileges and none of them threatening to stamp out the others or drive them into extinction, etc., then each nation can make decisions from an actual position of free, informed consent of whether they want to partially merge with other nations or start using some other language more or whatever it is. But that this is not an imperative, that probably uh, as a peaceful world socialist economy emerges, that using a common language is just going to be, you know, useful. It will be convenient. And so it will be adopted at least on that basis. But that doesn't mean that the nations will just completely give up all of their cultural heritage at the same time. Again, on the contrary, the various national cultural heritages will have much more of a basis for, you know, being able to preserve their culture, um, not in a reactionary way, but just um, they can decide what they want to do with it from there without, again, threat of violence against it. And so Stalin says that, you know, it's his opinion that in the sort of next or final stage of the period of world dictatorship of the proletariat, so after socialist victories in various countries, after the first or early period of the world dictatorship of the proletariat, in the latter stages of world dictatorship of the proletariat, quote, when the world socialist system of economy becomes sufficiently consolidated and socialism becomes part and parcel of the life of the peoples, and when practice convinces the nations of the advantages of a common language over national languages, that national differences in languages will begin to die away and make room for a world language common to all nations. But that's his opinion, and again, it's not a necessity. The only thing that is a necessity is peaceful, well-developed world socialism, and whatever happens with the languages is really not the primary question, not even really a question at all, aside from, you know, what happens in that early stage of the equalization of nations with regard to rights and privileges. So, no longer are some nations oppressing others and trying to drive others into extinction and assimilation, etc. So, once you've gotten over that and everybody can survive, you know, whatever happens in the development of world socialism for the peaceful, sustainable, economic existence of advanced human civilization, that's really the important thing. As socialists, we're concerned with creating a classless society free of exploitation. That is the thing. There's nothing specifically about, oh, we're trying to create, you know, a world that only has one language. That really is more like imperialist assimilationism. That's nothing to do with Marxism. So, you know, if it happens that people voluntarily adopt one language out of economic convenience, you know, so be it. My personal opinion is that people like some of the exclusiveness of, you know, having a secret language, whatever it is. And I say secret just because you can see it in your own life. How, you know, for example, the youth of every generation coming up has their own slang that makes them feel special and important. And language is in that sense, a way to identify other people who are like you in some sense, who sort of get whatever it is culturally that you get, you know, who are in on the joke, who see the world in a similar way. I don't know if on at least the micro level that will entirely ever fade away. But, um, you know, like I said, as Marxists, that's not really a question that we're primarily or even secondarily or even way down the list concerned with. Whatever happens with that will happen uh, our concern really is a socialist, peaceful, classless society where industry is run not for profit but for use, etc., etc. Also, just on the question of preserving different languages from a sort of literary, artistic perspective, different cultures, different peoples will develop different phrases to describe phenomena in the natural world, in human experience, and so on. Those contributions, you know, even if someone were to back off of other parts of a language, um, would probably be worth keeping just because, you know, as a contribution to the whole of human language goes, that language, you know, happened to cough up, you know, 20 or 30 real gems that probably would be preserved. So there's, you know, all kinds of things about language where sometimes people just like the sound of one language or it just is really predisposed towards a certain um, 
you know, it evokes certain things in the minds of people who speak and listen to and read that language. Just, you know, even down to the sounds and the rhythm and the grammar of a language and certain concepts that may be embodied in or implied by just the way that the language is set up itself. Um, there can be a lot of beauty in that, and people can, you know, have various attachments to that. And those can be things that are to be treasured and worth preserving. I think that all of those are considerations as far as, you know, when people decide to preserve a culture or move away from a culture, whatever it is. All right, let's continue. Four, the policy of the party on the national question. One of your mistakes is that you regard the national question not as a part of the general question of the social and political development of society, subordinated to this general question, but as something self-contained and constant, whose direction and character remain basically unchanged through the course of history. Hence you fail to see what every Marxist sees, namely that the national question does not always have one and the same character, that the character and tasks of the national movement vary with the different periods in the development of the revolution. Logically, it is this that explains the deplorable fact that you so lightly confuse and lump together diverse periods of development of the revolution, and fail to understand that the changes in the character and tasks of the revolution, in the various stages of its development, give rise to the corresponding changes in the character and aims of the national question, that in conformity with this, the party's policy on the national question also changes, and that consequently the party's policy on the national question, in one period of development of the revolution, cannot be violently severed from that period and arbitrarily transferred to another period. The Russian Marxists have always started out from the proposition that the national question is a part of the general question of the development of the revolution, that at different stages of the revolution, the national question has different aims, corresponding to the character of the revolution at each given historical moment, and that the party's policy on the national question changes in conformity with this. In the period preceding the First World War, when history made a bourgeois democratic revolution the task of the moment in Russia, the Russian Marxists linked the solution of the national question with the fate of the democratic revolution in Russia. Our party held that the overthrow of czarism, the elimination of the survivals of feudalism, and the complete democratization of the country provided the best solution of the national question that was possible within the framework of capitalism. Such was the policy of the party in that period. It is to this period that Lenin's well-known articles on the national question belong, including the article Critical Remarks on the National Question, where Lenin says, quote, I assert that there is only one solution of the national question, insofar as one is possible at all in the capitalist world, and that solution is consistent democratism. In proof, I would cite, among others, Switzerland, unquote. To this same period belongs Stalin's pamphlet, Marxism and the National Question, which, among other things, says, quote, the final disappearance of a national movement is possible only with the downfall of the bourgeoisie. Only under the reign of socialism can peace be fully established. But even within the framework of capitalism, it is possible to reduce the national struggle to a minimum, to undermine it at the root, to render it as harmless as possible to the proletariat. This is borne out, for example, by Switzerland and America. It requires that the country should be democratized and that the nations be given the opportunity of free development." Unquote. In the next period, the period of the First World War, when the prolonged war between the two imperialist coalitions undermined the might of world imperialism, when the crisis of the world capitalist system reached an extreme degree, when, alongside the working class of the metropolitan countries, the colonial and dependent countries also joined the movement for emancipation, when the national question grew into the national and colonial question, when the united front of the working class of the advanced capitalist countries and of the oppressed peoples of the colonies and dependent countries began to be a real force, when consequently the socialist revolution became the question of the moment, the Russian Marxists could no longer content themselves with the policy of the preceding period, and they found it necessary to link the solution of the national and colonial question with the fate of the socialist revolution. The party held that the overthrow of the power of capital and the organization of the dictatorship of the proletariat the expulsion of the imperialist troops from the colonial and dependent countries, and the securing of the right of these countries to secede and to form their own national states, the elimination of national enmity and nationalism, and the strengthening of international ties between peoples, the organization of a single socialist national economy, and the establishment on this basis of fraternal cooperation among peoples, 
constituted the best solution of the national and colonial question under the given conditions. Such was the policy of the party in that period. That period is still far from having entered into full force, for it has only just begun, but there is no doubt that it will yet have its decisive word to say. A question apart is the present period of development of the revolution in our country and the present policy of the country. It should be noted that so far, our country has proved to be the only one ready to overthrow capitalism, and it really has overthrown capitalism and organized the dictatorship of the proletariat. Consequently, we still have a long way to go to the establishment of the dictatorship of the proletariat on a world scale, and still more to the victory of socialism in all countries. It should be noted further that, in putting an end to the rule of the bourgeoisie, which has long since abandoned its old democratic traditions, we, in passing, solved the problem of the complete democratization of the country, abolished the system of national oppression, and established equality of nations in our country. As we know, these measures proved to be the best way of eliminating nationalism and national enmity, and of establishing mutual confidence among the peoples. It should be noted, lastly, that the abolition of national oppression led to the national revival of the formerly oppressed nations of our country, to the development of their national cultures, to the strengthening of friendly international ties among the peoples of our country, and to their mutual cooperation in the work of building socialism. It should be borne in mind that these regenerated nations are not the old bourgeois nations, led by the bourgeoisie, but new socialist nations, which have arisen on the ruins of the old nations, and are led by the internationalist party of the laboring masses. In view of this, the party considered it necessary to help the regenerated nations of our country to rise to their feet and attain their full stature, to revive and develop their national cultures, widely to develop schools, theaters, and other cultural institutions functioning in the native languages, to nationalize, that is, to staff with members of the given nation, the party, trade union, cooperative, state, and economic apparatuses, to train their own national, party, and Soviet comrades, and to curb all elements, who are indeed few in number, who try to hinder this policy of the party. This means that the party supports, and will continue to support, the development and flourishing of the national cultures of the peoples of our country, that it will encourage the strengthening of our new socialist nations, that it takes this matter under its protection and guardianship against anti-Leninist elements of any kind. It is apparent from your letters that you do not approve this policy of our party. That is because, firstly, you confuse the new socialist nations with the old bourgeois nations and do not understand that the national cultures of our new Soviet nations are in content socialist cultures. Secondly, it is because, you will excuse my bluntness, you have a very poor grasp of Leninism and are badly at sea on the national question. Consider, by way of example, the following elementary matter. We all say that a cultural revolution is needed in our country. If we mean this seriously and are not merely indulging in idle chatter, then we must take at least the first step in this direction. Namely, we must make primary education, and later secondary education, compulsory for all citizens of the country, irrespective of their nationality. It is obvious that without this, no cultural development whatever, let alone the so-called cultural revolution, will be possible in our country. More, without this, there will be neither any real progress of our industry and agriculture, nor any reliable defense of our country. But how is this to be done? bearing in mind that the percentage of illiteracy in our country is still very high, that in a number of nations of our country there is 80 to 90 percent illiteracy. What is needed is to cover the country with an extensive network of schools functioning in the native languages, and to supply them with staffs of teachers who know the native languages. What is needed is to nationalize, that is, to staff with members of the given nation, all the administrative apparatus, from party and trade union to state and economic. What is needed is widely to develop the press, the theater, the cinema, and other cultural institutions functioning in the native languages. Why in the native languages, it may be asked? Because only in their native, national languages can the vast masses of the people be successful in cultural, political, and economic development. In view of all that has been said, I think it should not be so difficult to understand that Leninists cannot pursue any other policy on the national question than the one which is now being pursued in our country provided, of course, that they want to remain Leninists. Is not that so? Well, then, let us leave it at that. I think I have answered all your questions and doubts. With Communist Greetings, J. Stalin, March 18, 1929. And that's the end of the audiobook. So, I actually had another comment I wanted to make 
about the beginning of Section 4. Actually, I thought that Stalin really addressed everything, so by the end of Section 4, I withdrew my comment. Very well said. So, if you've been following this channel for a while, you know that I have been working concertedly on a series addressing questions of war and nationalism from a Marxist-Leninist perspective for some time, a number of months, and actually with this text, we're nearing the end. There's a couple more that I want to do, but actually those are more like applications of these concepts in various circumstances rather than sort of the basics of the theory. Of course, you know, in these theoretical texts, there are obviously examples. Marxism is scientific and based on specific situations and accounting for conditions and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Just as in chemistry, you have to account for temperature, pressure, you know, and all the other conditions when you're trying to understand and influence a chemical process. Same thing in society. But uh, anyway, obviously the national question is something that runs throughout the entire course of Marxism, national questions are hugely important in considering the conditions in any revolution. So this, I think, is really fundamental to understand, particularly when right now, you know, recently there's been a uh, right wing movement to inject certain kinds of nationalism and patriotism into oppressor nations like the United States. Um, that's something that we need to reject. Again, the basic principle that we're looking for is reducing national strife and enmity and um, you know waving US flags is not a great way to do that. The real meaning of that flag that pops into people's minds, many people around the world, when they see that flag is uh, a hostile not a friendly one. Actually on that note to close this out I will just highlight something from near the beginning of section 4 here just to emphasize it. This is from the part where Stalin is talking about different periods of world development and how Marxists and any Marxist party needs to keep in mind what period are they in. For example, uh, are you in the period of the bourgeois democratic revolution? Are you in the period of imperialist war? And, you know, that's going to affect what your approach, what the approach needed to the national question is going to be. And if you're smart, it's also going to determine your party's policy because your party should be doing what is needed. So I'm going to just quickly read a couple of paragraphs here. In the next period, the period of the First World War, when the prolonged war between the two imperialist coalitions undermined the might of, we could say, combined world imperialism, when the crisis of the world capitalist system reached an extreme degree. Okay, let's pause right there. What did Stalin just say? The two imperialist coalitions? Huh. So, in other words, Stalin is saying that imperialism can be understood in a sort of combined sense when he references the might of world imperialism in general. But he said that in the First World War, there were this you know combined imperialism had split into two imperialist coalitions, which were fighting with each other, reaching an extreme crisis within the capitalist system, and it was undermining world imperialism, and of course out of this rift, uh, came due to the efforts of extremely well-organized and committed Bolsheviks, the first victory of socialism on a national scale. So, okay, you know, while the imperialists are fighting each other, the proletarians can have a win, but only if you're organized. And one need only refer to Lenin's writings from 1914 to about 1917, for example, all of his attacks on Kautsky and other prominent members of the Second Socialist International, who were basically jeopardizing this moment. The imperialist world was going into crisis. This was the time when the socialists were going to push forward with revolution. And then prominent socialist leaders were going renegade and telling their, you know, working class supporters, the working class in their various countries, to support, quote, their own bourgeoisie. Well, had it not been for Lenin and other committed revolutionaries, then the revolution never would have happened because things would have gone the way of Kautsky, with workers fighting and killing each other for the sake of, quote, their own national bourgeoisie in World War One. Of course, some of that happened, but it didn't happen everywhere, and some socialists were able to retain proletarian independence and internationalism, and they didn't go in for that bourgeois national imperialist war. But 
I believe that we're headed for a similar crisis. We recently had 2008. That was a global financial meltdown, as even the capitalists call it. And there wasn't a real economic recovery. After that, now we're in a pandemic and the United States and other places are coping with extreme, what they're calling inflation, price increases. It goes deeper than that, though. There is another economic crisis. Now Russia is, you know, there's more belligerent talk between Russia and the other imperialist bloc than there has been in a long time. Why do I say the other imperialist bloc? Just as Stalin said at the time, the two imperialist coalitions. Well, this is the point. A lot of times people will present imperialism as just this monolithic force. That's not really the way that it is. You can have more than one imperialist coalition. Obviously, the strongest coalition is going to stand out, and that would be the U.S. and the U.S.'s allies. But that doesn't mean that another imperialism is not possible. Lenin said and wrote an entire book about imperialism as the highest stage of capitalism. In other words, advanced capitalism leads to imperialism. Once the capitalists have conquered the home market, it needs to keep expanding, and that means exporting capital to other countries, taking them over, etc., etc. Where this conflicts with the aims of other non-allied or non-cooperative advanced capitalists, imperialists, you know, highly developed capitalist interests, then you get a war. Now, there's a lot of talk today in 2022 about, oh, this is going to be good for socialism because, you know, when the imperialists fight, that's automatically good for us. It's good for us when we're organized. What really concerns me today is that level of organization is not there at all in most places. And I'm hoping that we can get something going, you know, by 2030 or so. Um, I think that that's imperative. And I think that if people really work at it, which is going to be a struggle, this is class struggle after all, it's going to be a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of time. But I mean, if we can get that going, tremendous. That's what needs to happen. We need to, in large part, restart the communist movement around the world, which has fallen, unfortunately, very unfortunately, into revisionism and just general confusion. We need to emerge out of this as an educated, organized force again that clearly can see the direction in which it needs to go and has the means and the will to actually go there. Well, you know, otherwise, lacking that, what do you get out of imperialist war? Just misery, death, and a newly consolidated imperialist block of the victors, and then, you know, assimilation and force being used against whatever bourgeois nation is being punished by the victors, because that's what happens. The victorious nations, bourgeois nations, will try to punish the others for losing the war by putting all of the costs of the war onto them. So again, this just results in suffering for the working people, I mean, really on both sides, but especially in the losing nations, which are made to bear more of the economic costs of, you know, rebuilding everything. But even in the victorious nations, because there the working class has to confront a jubilant, you know, hyped up capitalist class, which is going to be all the more eager to oppress them and they have all the resources of the nations that they just destroyed at their disposal, which are going to be applied to the class exploitation that that faction of the imperialists is going to be prosecuting against, you know, the whole world, all the territories under its grasp, but especially against that domestic population. See the Red Scare, McCarthyism after World War II for just one example. So Stalin concludes that little section by saying that period is still far from having entered into full force, for it has only just begun, but there's no doubt that it will yet have its decisive word to say. Well, here we are in 2022, some, you know, 90 years later, it's still in full force. The imperialists still run the world, and capitalism has not fundamentally changed. It cannot fundamentally change. It's an unstable system based on deep contradictions. And, you know, like fault lines in the earth, these occasionally, you know, the pressure builds up and you get a devastating earthquake. Like I said, I believe that we're in one of those periods right now. So what are we going to do about it? Well, agitate, educate, and organize, and absolutely do not stop until we have victory for the working class in the class war. Not whatever sort of bizarre, you know, campist 
national conflict rooting on is going on in the name of socialism, which you can see across social media. This needs to be rejected and denounced at every turn, and eventually we won't see it anymore. But right now, we're still in struggle against it. In closing, Stalin, ten years before he wrote the piece that we just read, wrote another piece called Two Camps, February 1919, and it opens with these lines. The world has definitely and irrevocably split into two camps, the camp of imperialism and the camp of socialism. Over there, in their camp, are America and Britain, France and Japan with their capital, armaments, tried agents, and experienced administrators. Here, in our camp, are Soviet Russia and the young Soviet republics and the growing proletarian revolution in the countries of Europe without capital, without tried agents or experienced administrators, but on the other hand, with experienced agitators, capable of firing the hearts of the working people with the spirit of emancipation. The struggle between these two camps constitutes the hub of present-day affairs, determines the whole substance of the present home and foreign policies of the leaders of the old and the new worlds. So this was the beginning of Stalin's two camps, and basically this was on the heels of World War I, on the heels of the Russian Revolution, that is the October Revolution of 1917, the Socialist Revolution in Russia. And so as Stalin stood after a year roughly of socialist construction, in Russia. He stood there looking, you know, the ashes of World War I and what this massive first imperialist world war had conducted, you know, as it concluded there, and said, hey, we have a country now for socialism. And, you know, also in the countries of Europe, there is a growing proletarian revolution. The communist parties of Europe, uh, you know, and all the agitators that go along with those, there are now two camps. There's imperialists and there are the socialists. And, you know, it was splitting into different territories and everything. Well, unfortunately, the USSR, about 30 years ago, was dismantled. So we can no longer have exactly this view anymore. Stalin said that the world had definitely and irrevocably split. Obviously, the irrevocably was, you know, hopeful thinking. I think not you know, wishful thinking in the sense of it was empty wishful thinking, like they weren't following it up with action or anything. I think that it was ju just genuine hope, like, oh, we just did a revolution and probably this revolution will spread. And it did spread. Unfortunately, it was also dismantled a number of decades later. Now, there are still dedicated socialists the world over. There are even some countries that still have at least vestiges of their, you know, 20th century Marxist governments. That's great. But we also can't deny the obvious backsliding into capitalism and the revisionist thinking that has persisted, you know, at least since the 1980s, roughly the same period that uh, coincides with neoliberalism, like late 70s and the 80s in the United States. And that backsliding has taken on a number of different forms. One of the forms is blatant counter-revolution and overthrow of the proletarian governments of the Soviet Union. Yet people are still acting as though that as a, quote, camp is in the socialist column. It absolutely is not, and people need to stop thinking like this. As I mentioned before, it needs to be rejected and denounced every time that it shows its head, because the only way that we're actually going to get a serious and successful movement going is to realign with the methods and processes and procedures that originally worked, obviously updating for current conditions, but this doesn't mean eschewing the class struggle with like literally the thing that is most fundamental to this entire endeavor. You know, USA bad just doesn't cut it because as Stalin pointed out, there can be multiple rival imperialist groups that go to war with each other. This is literally the basis of world war. You cannot simply pick what you think is the lesser evil of them whether you're with Vosh and the Radlibs on the pro-USA NATO side, or whether you're with, you know, Caleb Maupin, Alexander Dugan, and all the other people lining up on the rival imperialist side while calling it anti-imperialism. That's not anti-imperialism. All right, hopefully this has been plenty of food for thought for now. I'll leave you with that. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion in the comment section as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and thanks to the current patrons, whose names are on the screen. Their support is invaluable. We don't run ads on this channel, so patron support is both encouraging and materially helpful. Thank you very much to the patrons, as always.
Also, whether you're a patron or not, engagement counts, like, share, subscribe, and comment. All of that helps YouTube to recommend this content to additional people. And finally, organize. Join the struggle in your community or at least state or country, whether it's a union or political party. This is hugely important. We'll see you next time.